This is CRM Audio, the Microsoft Power Platform and Dynamics 365 podcast. This episode is brought to you by Maplytics by Anagic, the market-leading certified for Dynamics 365 geo-analytical mapping app. Maplytics empowers users with powerful map visualizations and routing capabilities within Dynamics 365 to drive better sales, improve business processes, and engage the right customers at the right time. Find out more at maplytics.com. Welcome to Power Platform Quarantine at Audio. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't I don't remember where I am or what day it is anymore, but uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, joining me is George Dubinsky, Sean Tabor, and another Sean, Sean McNellis from Microsoft, PFE extraordinaire. How you doing, hey, McNellis? That's your real backyard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> Minneapolis, pretty good for Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's, it's pretty exactly. Sweet, pretty sweet. We're, uh, yeah, testing out some of the new... Uh, preview features for uh, the team's team. How about that? There nice. Nice. And Sean, that, Sean Tabor, that's that's not a fake background there. That's your No, this your is role. my oh. my resplendent nerd nerd cave. <laughs> <laughs> All of my toys. All right, so the big story that uh, everybody is living through right now is the COVID-19 shutdown worldwide. Um, and so, Sean how, McNellis, how is I was going to say Tabor or McNellis? So, McNellis, how Not is uh, how is this impacting what you're doing from the PFE and uh, the broader Microsoft team? I know there's a lot of things going on there. Yeah, absolutely. So, it's been really interesting um, as a PFE in the PFE role. Generally speaking, is a uh, you know, generally speaking, we have most people either entirely remote that go on site periodically. Or we do have a a certain number of PFEs um, that go on site every single day, like it's their their day job with the customer. That's where they work from. For them, there's a big change. Um, For those who travel on a weekly basis, huge change. Uh, A lot less miles, uh, but a lot less pollution. And I would argue a whole ton of extra productivity. Mm -hmm. Um, From a company perspective, it's really interesting. Um, You know, people who work from our our offices in Redmond now are working at home. So the The first two weeks were very novel, you know, like, hey, here I am. I'm at home. Isn't this cool? Um, And so people who are used to working in the field, it's uh, like, okay, yeah, that's neat. That's cool. Um, So I think there's an interesting amount of maybe empathy that comes out of this both ways uh, where people can say, hey, I know what it's like to work from home um, every day of the week. Or, you know, you're going, uh, my favorite observation is, I just go from call to call to call. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. I don't. Even, I can't even play, you know, table tennis. Um, so, you know, that's something that uh, I've never had. Well, I've had that experience kind of um, for a few years in Fargo. But um, anyway, so I think it's a good level setting of everybody. Um, and for customers too, there's a lot of customers that default to, I have an office, I have a desk, we have a contract, we have a PFE. Come on in every day or every week. Uh, this is really a forced uh, scenario. And so it's been a little hard at times, but I think a lot of customers have really rolled with it and it's sort of jumbled up the typical, maybe I don't like how this works or I don't want to join a web conference. Everybody has to do it. And so now we're all used to it. Um, and so I think it'll drive some interesting new behaviors as we we do our service delivery in the future. Um, it's interesting that I wanted to ask uh, um, uh, about uh, perception uh, of uh, people working remotely because one of the things I noticed that uh, uh, one of the pushbacks against working remotely always be from bosses kind of uh, I use the term generously uh, is pushback saying oh people would mow the loan and play with the kids and do some other stuff and I don't have control over that and uh, the productivity will drop. And now what we see seeing is that generally people are responsible adults. And uh, when they pay money for doing their work, they actually tend to do their work. Um, the other aspect, obviously, working from home, and I know that because I've been working from kind of uh, remotely, not not from home, but as far as customers concerned, I've been working remotely for the past few years is that you tend, when you work from home, one of the dangers is you actually work longer, much longer hours than you would do otherwise. You don't have a clear distinction. Uh, Like right now, we share an office with my wife and uh, she would stand up at 6 p.m. and say, okay, I'm leaving the office, bye. (laughs) (laughs) It's very true. 
Um, I moved to a home office and working remotely. Well, almost 10, it'll be 10 years ago in August, um, completely remote, my wife and I, and it, you know, it was a big, it was a big change. Um, I, at first, I think I was better at first at breaking away and like, this is my lunch. This is my time going to walk. Um, you know, it, it is an interesting, you know, there's pluses and minuses on both sides. So I'm not super great at, uh, you know, hey, we don't have much going on. You get stacked up with stuff, and next thing you know, it's six thirty, seven. You take a quick break for dinner, and you know, now it's I get my son on the uh, virtual classroom for Boy Scouts, and then I turn around and do conference calls because there's another conference call going on talking about whatever. So let's jump in, and everybody kind of knows that. Well, frankly, nobody has a life right now. Um, the secret: I didn't have one before, so this isn't much of a change. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, it. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, there'll be, as you know, there will be books written for decades on this period of time, and I'm sure people are collecting call data and collaboration data, um, and and we'll be looking at that. I think for really good reasons on what really works, what didn't work, and what can we do that makes sense this way. Um, I think it sort of underscores the importance of physical connections. Hopefully, there's this weird mental component biological component where being in the same space with others is absolutely as you guys know completely different you uh -huh. your brain they and they've proven it you know they put people under scanners and they watch how brains function differently um and i think this underscores the importance of those things whereas maybe before it's like we got video chat people use that right i don't use nah. it but you could i think you, know. you just feel guilty about wanting to strangle someone close to you as opposed to your co-worker <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that could be too yeah so now george you you had some things around this topic that were more developer and you know we're not we're not this isn't a developer episode but uh you now have your your developer moment here to ask your developer questions about github <laughs> oh uh no uh, uh we know that uh well dotnet core is coming and dotnet 5 is coming and yep. uh, we've been poking around with dotnet uh core alpha release of sdk libraries um but you you own kind of on github a uh, set of tools uh, pfe library um and other like powershell library with can so i just wonder like did you have a chance to play with it and what's your uh, this morning i read about all data and .NET uh, 5 which is kind mm -hmm. of a unifying thing coming up which is currently in alpha i think um anyway what's uh, what's your perspective did you have a chance in this lockdown to play with it and uh, um, uh, what's the future for the libraries and how it's going to change things yeah so I a little bit of a chance. I have a coworker, um, Bob Gittinger, uh, who's also on Twitter and has actually just released a um, ALM tool for Power BI that we're using on a project we needed to. I think George has a Bob Gittinger shirt, don't you? Just, I, I love Bob Gittinger shirt. I'm, I'm a big fan. I didn't have, we, we pimped Bob for MVP for quite some time and then he turned around and swallowed the pill. So I didn't know you worked <laughs> with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we great. work together. We uh, share a customer together. So we're working um, on a health and human service project. Uh, and so we've done some experimenting um, with things like um, mini custom portals. And uh, he's spent way more time at the controls of the Alpha SDK than I have. I I spent a little bit of time looking at it with Matt in Bellevue prior to the whole lockdown. Um, but Bob spent some actual time coding on it, which is pretty cool. Um, one of the really interesting things is you can put it into containers, um, like a Docker container. You can run it under Linux app service and ship these things completely. And it is really, really cool. And for things like you need antivirus, ClamAV has a Docker container, can run it. And before it would be like, well, how do we broker the connection between here and here and the VNet? And now it's two container or a container. You put it, you package it up, you deploy it. The two things can talk together. Um, it really opens things up. So I, I know he's really excited about it. Um, speaking for myself, I'm excited about it. I think um, having it capable of running on any platform is really cool, obviously. Um, and I think that unification piece of having all the libraries in there so people aren't going, oh, there's this one thing. 
these two big things that are that are deal breakers and now i can't do core um now we can with this library now you're talking v2 functions in azure um and and really from a developer perspective there's very little change um it, from my point of view at least it it's still code it looks the same it builds um, no, tell it to colin who's been busy writing the dependency injections left and right and encapsulating connections and things like that uh colin uh uh the colin verminder uh he's he's been doing um uh some uh open source development on that not dot net core um as far as uh, cds connections are concerned and things like that so it's really cool when it when it's more available and we kind of get the namespaces ironed out and some of the details finer details ironed out matt's been uh barber's been um just i think putting a lot of him and the team and more than him i'm sure are putting a lot of work into it and so it's pretty cool as far as you know we'll kind of wait um to see what happens with powershell i would not be surprised if we start working towards a first party um option there if not we'll look to convert it over um, and make it core capable. I mean, it's used a lot. I think I just saw the other day, it's pretty close to 300,000 um, installations from from PowerShell Gallery. So it's used, I think, a lot in ALM um, pipelines. I know I use it for some of my projects and we're converting over to the um, CDS um, build actions. But anyway, it's, yeah, it, it's really cool to see us going there finally and getting uh, to that direction and seeing the authentication libraries mature a little bit more into um, MSAL where hopefully things kind of get vetted out a little bit better. It's a smoother um, process to get everybody onboarded onto one authentication library. Um, so yeah, it it's we'll, well see. It's with your year last question, I suppose, uh, with your PFA library, are you looking kind of for the moment where you can just hit uh, compile and it just works or you actually rewrite in uh, parts of the library to take advantage of perhaps uh, different things in core for the pfe core library yeah the parallelism stuff yeah um you know good question i don't know um it i think back to the when we architected it um, myself and a gentleman by the name of austin jones and austin's in the product team now um working on some really cool projects as well and it was really around simplifying the connection, simplifying retrieve, simplifying, abstracting away the stuff that is not super complex, but just there's a lot of moving pieces. So it's easier for people just to say, I've got one of these created. Now I want two of them create them or two million or whatever. Um, I think right now we, I moved over to service um, client instead of org service. So there's a V9 branch on GitHub now with a slightly different naming because Microsoft owns the Microsoft namespace and I'm not the company. So I think it's, uh, I can't remember the name offhand, but I will, we'll have to see how people are continuing to use it or if there's still a need for it. And then we convert it over, um, you know, and, and as far as I know, one of the things we want to talk about a little bit today was, um, throttles. One of the things you get with service client is there is some, at least really, um, rudimentary basic throttle handling within a service client. So it has the ability to say, Oh, that was an exception because of throttling. Uh, you hit an API limit, service protection limit. I'm going to go ahead and pause on that operation for, I think the default is five or 10 seconds, and then I'll retry up to five times, 10 seconds apart. And these are policies you can change. Um, so that was one of the big reasons I wanted to get that working in the core library because you're always brushing up against the throttles, if not, you know, slamming into them head first. Um, and and I know we wanted to talk a little bit about throttles. There are two different types of throttles going on. One is an entitlement throttle. Those aren't fully uh, wired in quite yet. And then there's this idea of a service protection throttle. Um, service protection is the one you get back, which says, hey, you've done more than n number of seconds within a minute, whatever. Um, you, you get back some detail about, hey, you're overloading uh, the service. And so those are obviously really important. Uh, fun fact about those, when those service protection throttles went in, we saw a significant increase in service availability and decrease in service outage calls. Um, so there, it was too easy for a you know, select set of customers that were very busy to negatively impact uh, a scale group or a you know, group of servers that, that serve up our service. So 
service protection throttles, which a lot of services have um, by us putting that in. I know Charles and the, the ops team have seen a like huge improvement in how the service continues to be resilient and stay online. So I, I think that's an important message that a lot of customers don't understand. They think of throttles as people as being limited and they are, but there's good reason for them. So what you just mentioned is if we had no throttles, the service would grind to a halt for everybody, basically, right? Because <laughs> people yep. would be doing so we have to have a reasonable amount. And working with your team, you know, we've had a customer that has to do a large migration in a short time window or something, they can be raised, right? You can you can temporarily raise those throttles. We have been able to manage through exception before. And I I believe I'm not speaking too far out of school to say that um, there there's a couple things to keep in mind. And, and actually, this dovetails into one concept I want to make sure we talk about, which is if you're writing an integration, if you're using Kingsway Soft, if you're using the core library, using an application user is important. Yeah, eventually, the goal is that we'll have some sort of overcommit or um, you know this fuzzy area of Oh, hey, you've been, you know, uh, the way Azure does it, have burstable workloads or burstable VMs. Maybe this concept of, you know, you've been good here or you have a very smooth pattern of usage. Now you're going to spike up for a few minutes. Um, right. Let's allow that and well, let's and not just go hard that's on that. Good, that's a good transition point because that is something that was announced in October, I believe it was, or September actually, but it didn't really sink in because it hasn't been enforced yet. Now right. it's starting to be enforced and people like Fast Track are bringing it up on projects. And we still don't have really granular reporting to tell you how many API calls you're using in a day, uh, but it's coming. And uh, once that comes, the expectation is Microsoft is going to start sending people bills when they exceed that, exceed that limit in some way. That hasn't been clearly communicated yet. But um, the limits, and see if I get this right, so test, test me here, it's 20,000 per day per login password user, and then a pool of 100,000 per day for all your application users in kind of a shared pool, because you can create as many application users as you want, so they have you know, this one pool, right? right? So, yeah. and again, I've looked at it, and, and I've seen some big customers, and in, in at least working with support, we figured out that they're within the limit, but there's some of them that have, you know, like once a month they hit a million or more API calls, then the rest of the month they're under that. So I, I think that's where some clarification is needed. You know, how is Microsoft monitoring that is gonna be you go over by ten percent one day every six months, you're gonna get a whammy or what? You know, okay, so really good question. Um again, I just wanna underscore two two different types of throttles, one being service protection, one being entitlement. Entitlement meaning tokens that you put in the machine or tokens you're expiring when you're doing a, a limit. Or I a think call. Joel couldn't hear you because he's got this big can headphones on, so he couldn't <laughs> hear you before. You. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to make sure that's clear. And thank you very much. Because <laughs> I will tell you the difference between an entitlement, like a, a resource limit and a throttle, it's it makes a lot of sense that that's confusing, right? Because they'll both stop you potentially, right? That was right? a great sense. It makes sense that it's confusing. <laughs> well, it, it does make sense that it's confusing. <laughs> I think we have an episode title. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Look, but Good. step in step in just a little bit about the throttle limits, uh, which has nothing to do with licensing and users right. and nothing like that, right? So um, uh, one thing that, didn't stop to amaze me is people saying because it was uh, free for all right so people were abusing and abusing probably in some instances not even intentional just simply because lazy programming so to speak right so i could do it so i don't care about quality of my code i just need to get things on bam 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 done and abusing basically bashing the service as hard as they could um and people, when Microsoft started introduce these limits, started introducing these limits, people complain and say, oh, Microsoft, you know, going for money grab and say, wait a minute, you tell me, show me a single public service, right, uh, that takes customers' money um, and it's well-known service that doesn't have those limits. Like every single service I know has some kind of throttling going on 
because yeah, it's impossible to, so it's to provide. Like, say I'm going to go to Salesforce because their their yeah. API limits are are higher or less expensive. Right. right. Yeah. So oh, Salesforce had it all the time. So uh, I'm just amazed that people you take this free thing they took for granted. You take it away and say, hey, look, guys, we really need to maintain quality of service. Yeah. Um, and people start writing, ah, oh, now I have to think when I write code, damn. <laughs> well, I think, so I see both sides of this one really well, um, I believe, at least. Um, I, the part we're missing, and Joel hit on it, I think we've all hit on it, the, the lack of the ability to have insight here. Can't If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Ah, um, that's some, he's, that's a, uh, he's that's for a, you, right? Yeah, it's Every a common, API call should return how close am I to the threshold. Well, and they do for the throttle, for the service protection throttles, they will tell you you know, they you've will. Done this much. They don't. Yep, there's a response in Web API. Um, and if you hit for certain throttles, not every single one of them, the on the entitlement throttle, though, actually for both, not being able to measure it is killer. And so there is a, you know, there's a lot of work being done right now by the, the PPAC team, um, the admin center team to add reporting in. And it's unfortunately not super trivial. Um, so it, it's taking longer than, than maybe we would want it to. Um, but I mean, that's a, that's a mantra from our customers. It's a mantra from uh, our internal field people. And I think they, you know, people on our product group know that you need to, you can't measure it. You can't improve it. Um, well, I think the, t I think the lesson from the team member license is if you don't really give people clear direction on how to comply with a rule, yep. you can't blame them for not complying with it. Same thing, right. like. Flow, for example, Power Automate. When we create a Power Automate flow using the CDS connector, it should tell us this will use X number of API calls and then show you like if you put in a change set, then it will use this many per run or something like that. That's the kind of kind of thing that would be really helpful because I think it's this unknown quantity. Business likes dependability, especially mm -hmm. these days when everything's so undependable um, and having the pers having the perspective that I could, without trying, get a big bill that I haven't budgeted for scares people, especially with right. the messaging around citizen developers, spin up as many CDS environments as you want, have yep. individuals writing flows and power apps and things like that. Um, businesses want to be able to predict or come close to predicting what this is going to cost them, and, and they don't want to get a surprise bill. Budgeting yeah, I, is a reality. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. I, I I had a customer who was really interested in in using uh, Power Automate and Canvas apps, and they had you know over twenty thousand team licenses. So the license impact caused us to deviate completely from our design and and just change the the plan altogether. And it, it wasn't it, it it had an impact on a couple of sides not only on the you know we had already went started going down a path of explaining how these cool new features are going to help them in their business process which they got excited about and then we had to rip it away and say okay we're going to do something different that still mm -hmm. met the objective but not in the same cool way right well, part part of that falls on sales and you know we yeah. can we can bash the sales people now but okay easy um, great you know <laughs> i think we've all seen the case where either a partner salesperson or a microsoft salesperson at the end of the fiscal year over promises something to get a yeah. deal and to meet their number and you know i haven't seen that happen a lot but i have examples of where a sales people person has pushed team members within the last six months yeah. knowing that these enforcements were coming. So in that in that case, that's the that's a hard hurdle to get over. If somebody was told, for example, hey, you can do back in the Dynamics portals days, you know, yeah, you could do a portal for all your people, and then they find out, no, we can't. Yeah, because <laughs> no licenses. So, uh, so yeah, so that's that's not. I was a salesperson, so I I I, I can commiserate with salespeople. But I think it's it's the reality that it it is coming, and I think. Yeah, you know, biggest point is just we need more information before we can do that. But with that in mind, we talked about the throttles. Let's throttle back to the throttle conversation and talk yep. a little bit about the APIs. So what are the things you would say, and this applies throttles too, for a deployment, what are the biggest 
mistakes you see people make like developers or integrators or people who configure or build apps that set them behind the eight ball for for the throttles or the, or the limits or what should so what should people be doing differently than they generally are now so yeah and maybe even just beyond uh throttles and limits but uh, one of the big things so designing beginning with the end in mind as far as design goes with deployment the integrating it into something like azure devops making it deployable uh you know one click build and deploy seems like uh it's, it's easy to do but i don't have time right now it's a little too hard i don't have the hours um i can go into a story about directly related to some of the COVID stuff which i'm sure everybody's inundated with but why that matters um in terms of api throttling i think when we look at code the the big things to do to prepare for the future are um try and optimize what you're connecting for uh, and what you're doing so time and number of of api calls um that's the, a lot of analysis can go into that um but kind of know what you're getting into um adequate logging is huge because i think you can tell pretty quickly um and i think once we get our ppac report for api calls that will help a lot um you know here's the source along those lines you know app user app user app user create an app give it credentials better yet use managed identity if you're using azure um smash these concepts together and use an application user so you're using modern authentications from a security perspective it's much better you can rotate passwords um so, so that will help app user stuff is there mm -hmm. a ministering minute what a point of minimal returns that you reach a certain point because if you have a shared api pool of a hundred thousand per day and you've got busy integrations then you've got flows using service principles this this all can add up and if you've got this limited pool of a hundred thousand per day yeah. do you reach a point where it makes sense to start using some regular Maybe user users. accounts in there as well so I kind of stick with them. We had some folks, uh, one of the guys is no longer at Microsoft. He moved on to a different company, but I, his mantra around throttles were always throttles and like using multiple users and that sort of thing is if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. Um, I, I don't, because not, not everything is fully implemented and we don't have the reporting. I, that's a really tough question to answer because mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of the named user versus app user workaround or multiple users to sort of bypass the throttle because eventually we sell a license and API calls at a, at a cost. The better we can, the faster we can make the service, the higher density we can get, the better experience, the more people, the more scale, you know, margins come into place or probably more accurately, it reduces our costs to get those things out to customers and you get more for your, your dollar. Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to verify another thing just to make sure my understanding is correct. Mm -hmm. My understanding is system actions don't count against the API call, and that includes both the Athena export to Data Lake and the right. data export service. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. That's, so that's my understanding as well. If you do well. things reporting or integrations that are read heavy, uh, yep. one thing I've started recommending is don't read from the live database. That's yep. probably better for performance reasons anyway. but export either to sql with that with des or or to the um to a data lake. lake and then read from there and then only yep. connect to basically update or write data yeah and that's a really good pattern to use i mean working on a project now where um initially the the design was get an integration out to a data lake you know if athena lands in that particular environment then we can use athena if not we'll have to do something else but get it into the data lake and then put Synapse. So we've been working a little bit with the Synapse product group on on-demand queries as well as SQL pool. Um, if you're familiar with SQL Data Warehouse in Azure, the Synapse pools is just Data Warehouse's rename. Mm -hmm. um, but the SQL on-demand stuff is really cool. Um, there should be some, some more features hopefully coming around that to make it easier. But uh, doing your BI, like high-scale BI, um, you know, very complicated um, aggregations or um hopefully we get time series data so append only immutable storage in data lake where it every time you update it lays a new version of the record down and then you can reduce it down for a time series there's some great 
BI capabilities that are sort of right under the surface that we're scratching um, right now, but it helps with API calls. But if you're looking to do high scale reporting, using Athena into a data lake and figuring that out early is it helps with the API calls, but it will also help in terms of what you can do with Power BI or whatever reporting solution you want, be it Snowflake does, or anything yeah. else. How does dual write impact this now that that's generally available for people that have FNO and, and what we used to call CE, which we don't know what to call it now. Uh, CDF, finance. Yeah. How does dual write, if I have my data going near real time from FNO into, into CDS, is that count as a system action or does that count against my API elements? That is a fantastic question, and I don't know the answer to it because that <laughs> politician answer there. Yeah. Well, I literally had not thought of that scenario. I thought I had most of the first party scenarios, but I that is one that I don't know. So we'll have to get I back can to imagine that one. if uh, hopefully it's set up in a way because it's more of a system platform function. Right. Um, yeah. If you have an F and O integration that's using SSIS or something like that, if you can move that to there but also virtual entities you know is another thing that are getting more powerful now as well i can imagine that's also a good a good way to limit the number of reads and writes directly yeah. to cps as well it could be yeah virtual entities yeah um i'm, I'm trying to think of a scenario where that would work real well i mean it, it's scenario specific um right. and i you know i'm not trying to speak for anybody um on the cog side like cost of goods side or uh on charles's team i but i think what's happening as we get the reporting up and we discover more and more scenarios we are working with that team my the team i work on with uh the fast track team and others to try and make sure we're surfacing as many common customer scenarios and at the end of the day i think what's really important to know is that over 95 percent of the customers the the throttles weren't just randomly picked out of thin air they did a lot of discovery on the majority, and I mean the large, not just your 80-20 majority, like 95 plus percent, don't even come where, anywhere near. Um, that's great news, but I know all three of us on the phone call work with a lot of customers that are in that top 1%, mm -hmm. if, if not the top, certainly the top 5 I, most I've of the time. I've heard that some of the people that are the biggest offenders are some of the smaller customers. I've heard stories of five user deployments with petabytes of data and things like that. I, I have uh, I have heard similar things where there are a couple where, where it was actually really kind of unclear. Was it a runaway situation that just left left running? Um, yeah, there, there have been, I have heard the same thing. I've heard there's been a couple of those out there. And I don't think our, like on the big customer side, I don't think anybody's, abusing it's you know i think george made a really good point you just don't know um and then again it comes back to reporting but it also comes back to our apis maybe there's a more efficient way for us and that's what i think this will drive long term is putting some limits out there we'll probably adjust those limits like we have the throttles like we have other things and we'll probably find that right balance where it makes sense and then the other thing is too if everybody has a scenario where i'm making this thing this call, this update, or I'm downloading data from my instance, and that takes a ton of API calls, and it's bad for you, Microsoft, it's bad for me, it, it's expensive. You know, that's a really, in my opinion, comes down to a pretty easy feature to go, this is worth it. Maybe over the next semester, we look at offering a new API call for this, we offer a new service, and we kind of use that as a mechanism to say, this is, this is worth it for us, it's worth it for the customer. Um, you know, that kind of discussion happens today already. Look, everybody's doing it this way. Can't be wrong. So is it bad <laughs> guidance? Did, do we give new guidance? Do we offer a new API? Do we, you know, which is awesome. Uh, you know, I think that people are shedding that thing of, we set it this way six years ago, so that's the way you have to do it. And now it's, wait a minute, why is everybody doing it this way? Should we, how do we address this in a way um, where, where hopefully we can improve the service, improve what people are doing, lower the API calls. Because, the, you know, and again, I, I mentioned it briefly before, but if it costs our company less to host it, you know, less resources, that means we get more density, we can give you more performance, better speed, more API calls for the same amount of money, hypothetically, right? Or yeah. offer different features. So, and that, you know, that isn't just a, this should happen, that those conversations do happen. And so this is just a, I think an evolution of that um, 
And it is really interesting to see now that Charles has spent, I mean, I don't know, what has it been, two years? Maybe a little more yeah. on fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. You guys have heard it, right? Yeah. There's been a ton of fundamentals work. And, you know, I know I just uh, emailed a product team guy the other night and said, I know I don't say this enough, but thank you so much because they are really doing a lot of great work um, and nobody can do everything 100% perfect. But man, is the the culture and the approach has changed significantly. You know, I showed a customer once the number of updates that go through on an environment. This is the type of updating we're doing. He's like, what? We didn't even know that. So you mean we're getting an update at least once a week? Absolutely. Um, and they what, were the customer that used to call me on every update. The, the solution manager and see all the patch solutions and all that that yeah. you don't even notice go in there. Um, it's amazing. But it along, with, along with the limits, there are three kind of big things kind of going down now or will be by the end of the year. Most of those have been delayed because of Microsoft decided that this isn't the time to spring changes on people. Yep. But um, you talk about shutting off the classic UI. You talk about enforcing the team member licenses and the capacity storage change everybody's seeing when they go there. Those are a lot of kind of fundamental big changes that people yep. are, are seeing this year. How is What's your perspective on that from the PFE side? What conversations are you having with customers? What are you hearing from them? Yeah, change is hard. <laughs> That's it's hard. Yeah. Um, okay, my question. Is, <laughs> we we had we we had a customer uh, who hasn't moved a unified interface yet. And this was several months ago, and uh, we reminded them that it was coming in October at the time, and uh, and they they said, "Oh no, we got we have it scheduled. We have it scheduled when we're when we're moving." And I said, "Okay, well, when when are you looking?" He gets October. I said, yeah, you're cutting it a little close. <laughs> and so, yeah, so yeah. I'm sure they were very happy about the uh, December move. But, uh, uh, but I was uh, I was wondering the one thing I wanted to to ask about all these changes and uh, kind of uh, about all these uh, uh, throttle limits. They affect to to a certain degree uptime, right? And I remember a few years back we've been in this war room where all the uptime is monitored, and um, I'm sure you're a frequent visitor to that room. Um, and I've been wondering in the current climate, how's that going? How people actually provide support, uh, first line of support, because they do need this humongous monitor on the wall, right? Yeah. Um, so how how is that working? So you mean especially with the people working from home, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of that work has now gone to transition into the development teams. Quite frankly, meaning they are responsible for their own queues as calls come in. There is some um, some service operators um, that work just on you know having access to services and and elevated access, but um, the team has gone from when you guys saw the the operation center. The team has changed significantly since then in terms of um, really adopting true to heart the DevOps model. Um, and you know there are some really good things with that, and there are some negatives. Um, but because of that, a lot of the devs are on call and they trade, you know, they trade shifts, and a lot of times they're working from home. Um, so I don't, I have not noticed. Um, from my perspective or a customer's perspective, a difference in um, their ability to respond or, ha or handle this, um, which is just really thinking about it right now is pretty remarkable. Um, in general, things have gone very smooth from that perspective. I haven't noticed much of a difference. Um, pivoting a little bit on that though, I mean, I, a couple of things I wanna mention and we didn't mention at the top, um, but um, Microsoft, for anybody that's interested, if you just search Microsoft and COVID-19, there's a, a news article page that kind of lists Microsoft's response and what what we are offering um, with gratuitous licensing or services and that sort of thing, depending on what kind of company you are, um, depending if you want to use Teams or not, there's different entitlements that go for a certain number of months or, or what have you. Um, and if you're a larger customer working with your account team on, hey, what can you do for me? There are things like even if Teams is completely free for you, um, maybe you want fast track assistance and you've got, you got to get on you know, let's say a thousand users uh, in classrooms on board of the teams. I work with other PFEs in Texas, uh, a couple of them, and 
they, they were literally onboarding thousands of people every single day of the week uh, from the Zoom to for, Teams. For right, yeah. What's that? From Zoom to Teams. I well now maybe uh, before yeah. it was. I mean sometimes from nothing to Teams because uh, they didn't yeah. have uh, my kids at school. Luckily had a very good distance learning program um, already in place and they just activated it. So we didn't need a lot of the extra time, which is really cool. Um, the other thing is though, too, I, I mentioned that with Bob and I working on this health and human services customer, um, they have a clinic based business. You have to go in and see them to interact with them in, in these several states and a couple of Indian nations. And um, I, I tell you what, we've been working with them nonstop the past four weeks now. Um, I said three before, but it's been four, I guess. Um, and it has been amazing and a lot of work, right? Adopting hundreds of thousands of text messages uh, to blast out to people to tell them new processes. Um, we have people that work in clinics that are now working from home where they go into the clinic and then they're converting into drive up um, because you still, you. You can do things online, but taking that that maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes or even an hour sometimes of a clinic filling out paperwork and stuff, a lot of that we've been able to last minute, low turnaround to put it out digitally. So someone can get call up the clinic. Hey, you know, can you help me out? They shoot a text over to that person. They can sign up. They can enter in their information, take a picture, sign on their phone. These are all kind of table stakes with most companies, but we're that hasn't been a need because you have this physical presence. It's those types of businesses and companies where a lot is happening. It takes a lot of effort, but I want to work back into the ALM suggestion when you said, what can you do today to set yourself up better? We've gone from a release maybe once every three to four months with this group. Uh, it's a lot to move into sometimes releasing twice in a week. Um, wow. And luckily, We've got some people involved that are really big on let's make sure we've got ALM going. Let's make sure we're doing things repeatably. All of that, all of those seeds that are planted are, are coming back and we're able to harvest that now. And anyway, it's been, you know, it's been really interesting because when you're in a room of people that say, or a virtual room of people that say, we only release every three to four months because we need six weeks of UAT and blah, 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 blah. And you go, can we get weekly or daily releases? You know, and everybody puts on mute and laughs like are you kidding me that's impossible and all of a sudden now <laughs> something like this happens and it's like we can't let people in the clinic it right. it might be we don't even know it might be health hazard but we need to help them they have to eat or they have to and it's like guess what we're doing daily releases you know like, and that can be a 24 hour day or a five hour day or you know? a yeah. bunch of times now what drives your digital transformation your ceo or covid you know right this is this is pushing a lot of things. I've been wanting like call centers and customer service. You know, there were a lot of customers that had on-premise call centers and things like that. And I'm yep. wondering how are they all transitioning? I know um, we've done some work on, with that, and but imagine if you had five had a hundred people in a call center and now they can't come in, but you need to keep taking calls. That's an immediate need to change to. A different approach yeah and if you don't yeah. have an investment in soft phones and things like that it's it's a tough transition tough and transition the same customer they have a a large call larger not huge but largish call center large enough they have access to the uh, the system we're hosting but um you know the phone bit was like there was a huge scramble what are we going to do um we looked at teams we looked at Every, I mean, everything is on the table, right? Um, that's the other thing, the culture of the company being different. It's like, okay, if team's not going to work because it's not in the zone, what will? Mm -hmm. um, and as it turns out, they were able to work with their telephony provider, and I think we've got a solution for them. But um, I just, I, the acrobatics that are going in to make this, to decouple things that have always been tightly coupled, not because they need to be, but just because it's easier to leave it that way, is really interesting um and i i often wonder you know like with gdpr it, it forced changes within microsoft that we didn't even know we could make in such short periods of time stuff mm -hmm. tons of amazing like stuff that would blow your mind in terms of you know this doesn't you can't delete out of that it's not possible well it's guess what we have 30 like days delete audit trails and change uh disabled user records 
Yeah, or think bigger <laughs> services within Microsoft, like right. telemetry services and and stuff where it, not because of uh, you know negligent, it just was never like designed for that. And what was interesting about that, anyway, getting away from the specific stories, is that was done in an incredibly short period of time. And I think it reset the bar in terms of, okay, we can do this if we need to. And so when things like Jedi comes up, we can do this if we need to. Uh, you know, things like COVID. Um, those trials that we've been through, I have really pushed, you know, teams being there and being more decoupled between the service layers so that we can scale, you know, tens of times higher than what we were, you know, scaling. Um, and so it, it's just really unbelievable. But I wonder in the marketplace, if this sets a new bar in terms of we need to get going quickly and let me tie it back to power platform. We need to get going quickly before you'd go, let's do low code, no code flow, blah, 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 blah. We'll put this together and they go, well, we don't have to do that. Uh, I wonder if this maybe changes the attitude a little bit and you go, well, we can decouple away from this here and let's do something quick. Let's roll it out there because we know that we have a more resilient business. Um, it'll be incredibly interesting over the next six months, but even the next year, year and a half to see how this impacts customer thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and what they're willing to do, not because they're pushed, but maybe it doesn't matter as much anymore. And maybe they're they're less tied into it has to be this way because it's always been this way. Um, and, you know, this gives us a new thing to really think about. How do we be nimble? And that could be standing up a new call center in a new location or that could be, you know, a lockdown like this or, you know, it, it to me, it it's a terrible thing. But it uh, hopefully one of the outcomes we get is a really good way to architecturally approach these things and talk to customers more honestly about what can happen and how to enable them. Because this stuff does matter. Companies that had that VoIP platform, even if they weren't using it, turn it on, bang, now it's now you're using it. If right. you didn't have that before, that could set you back three, four weeks, you know, contracts. So, yeah, I know this is more of the same. I'm sure everybody who's listening to this or you guys have been through this, but it, it's fascinating for me to sit and think about. Um, well, an interesting thing to me is with all the colleges closed and high schools, kids, kids working from home, they're all using Teams or Zoom or some kind of some kind of meeting yeah. like this. This is giving them exposure to this technology, so they're going to be the people coming to the workforce next, and right. this is now part of their lives. I mean, my my fifth grade son is getting on Zoom meetings every week, and it's like he would have never done that before for any reason. Yeah, so, it's interesting. So um, yeah. one thing um, that I always used to ask you or Sean Deacon when I would see you at Convergence or whatever, that I, I'd love to get your take on now. I would always ask you, what's the top things you're getting that support is getting calls about? And it was always Outlook Client or Dynamics Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> Those two things. So I'm curious, how has that changed? Like, what, what are the what are you know the, some of the top things that uh, you that support tickets are logged about these days? No, that's a really good question. So being more decoupled from the direct like phone support team, um, I, I don't have a great sense of it. Um, I probably should have looked into that. It's been kind of a busy few weeks, but uh, I, I don't know like the top call drivers per se. Um, you know, I will say like server side sync um, outlook add in configuration always as a call driver. And, you know, the beauty is it's not because the com add in crashed or didn't load. Yeah, it's, it's other stuff now, like how do we configure the right sync? Um, you know, what's the re best way to roll this out? So it, it's changed the conversation there a little bit. Um, or like you, if you stop syncing a contact, then you want to sync it again. That's always the tough one. Yeah, that, and then, you know, certain things with appointments and delegates and, you know, it, and I will say I, I can foresee that being a little bit more of a call driver now, too, because we have an announced deprecation of the actual combat. And, and now people are also moving to that actively where maybe they hadn't had that before in some cases. So I think there's some more questions around that. Um, well, and if, if the uh, if the if the power apps people ever fully wake up that this capability is there and start using it, that would really blow that up, too, because I think generally people I see with power apps are building are having emails sent via the outlook connector or something haven't really woken up that hey we got this email activity inside cds so right 
Yeah. yeah so I think that's one. The other one is um, I know for our team talking about UCI, the UCI scenarios, covering the gaps, um, if there are any, or, or you know, this is one of those valid, it might not do that one thing, but it's still, you still get the outcome. It's a different way to do it. Um, there are still, in my opinion, there's still a couple gaps there that I'll, I'm sure they'll be out before October yeah, or on it's, October it's not, 1st. But it's not like, I'm not seeing showstopper stuff with UCI anymore. Nope. But I am seeing really. it quirks where why don't we have the view related records drop down on this form but we have it over here that's yep. that sort of thing yeah and the biggest headache is in my opinion just these more complicated customers getting them moved over it you know it's just a hurdle and there are sins of the past that have to be dealt with now um but at Oh, working with a very large customer, we're going to UCI. We're going before we're, we're setting our sights on a, a September. Um, even with the delay, I think we can make it work. But um, you know, we're moving from legacy to UCI, and and they were still using IE, and there was a couple of services they had bought that required that and hadn't been updated. And so, it it's like just going to UCI isn't that big of a deal, but dealing with you know cores issues or getting these services updated, and it's not. It's not necessarily a huge, huge, huge project in many cases. Sometimes it yeah. is. IE isn't the browser that gets the bulk of the testing now, too. So if you're going to have an issue, it's probably going to be an IE user, not a Chrome right. user. Yeah, um, so what we're doing right now is we're decoupling from IE in the legacy web client. And then as soon as we get that nailed down and we have people onboarded, we're rolling out Edge, um, the new Edge for everybody. Once that happens, then it's UCI time and then you know, move from there just to get it's off of IE customers, the bigger ones going to IE sticking with one main model driven app or are people adopting the micro app strategy? You know, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, the, I believe in the case of this one customer the one who's on IE and, and they're minority, not a lot of customers are still on IE, but, um, that will probably go with the app strategy because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and as you folks know, in moving, if you're moving horizontally across what you're doing, having one larger app makes a lot more sense. If you have an X department and a Y department and a Z department, and they don't really cross that much, then you get a lot more flexibility with multiple apps. Um, if it's one so main I, process, users don't like to switch between different apps. Yes. But could you could have one main app, and I'm seeing people do helper apps or scenario specific apps. Sometimes they're canvas, sometimes model. But like if you have this one thing you do every three months, have a unique app for it. But yep. if it's sales and customer service and they cross pollinate each other, then then one app still makes sense. I think similar. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's not much different than how you look at things like multiple forms versus single forms. It's it's it is different, but it's the same type of thing where if you have all this crossover, you kind of need things in one spot. Um, if it has discrete boundaries, then it makes more sense um, where where things are really interesting, I think, is retail and frontline workers. If you have like three different concepts and maybe they do all three, you might have like a landing page that they go to and you have URLs to each app. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen that. Like, imagine if you're a gym or something and you might have personal training and you've got like scheduling and new memberships, it would make sense. Like I think from a business point of view to say, we've got three discrete apps and when a person logs in, they see that home homepage and they click on that, whether it's our homepage or it's one that they do. Um, but that way it's like, I've got, I'm doing a uh, personal training. Boom. I'm in there. I'm doing personal training. Uh, I need to uh, sell a membership, I go home, go back here. And I have a different experience. Um, that kind of thing. I, is pretty interesting and I think apps actually work pretty well that way. So are you recommending to people, this is something we've had a debate kind of internally about for some people. Are you recommending people build on the hubs like sales hub or customer service hub or they set up custom model and apps? And the reason I ask that is the product teams are building the settings for those into the hubs now. So like mm -hmm. the sales features to convert Word documents to PDF or the yep. SLA and Q settings, those are in the settings of those hubs. And so, and there's also, they've added some functionality that only works in the hub and doesn't work in custom model driven apps. Right, so, like, the, like the service configuration settings. Yeah, things like yeah. That. So, yeah. so I'm kind of torn because old Joel would say, 
you should create your own Maldron app because Microsoft is going to pass an update and screw your app up or something. And mm. but then you know we don't do that for field service or marketing. So I'm kind of turning around to say let's use the hubs. I, I was curious what your thought was. I if it's pretty cut and dried, I go the hub route. A lot of the, I mean, a lot of the customers I've been working with are really a mixed bag and mashup of various entities and and, and the legacy app. They will go into a custom app initially. Um, what I've seen some cu- or heard some customers talking about is they're going to bring forward their deployment, but then they're going to stand up let's say they're very service oriented or it's for a business group and then they want to roll it out for global sales, they'll use the sales hub to roll in the new users because there's this really interesting thing and a lot of companies are finally, well, they're getting on board with it. I guess they have been on board in the past, but it doesn't come out that way, which is let's stay as out of the box as we can. Um, And the UCI upgrade is a firm reminder of that. Now, we all know being around the product for so long, like these you had to do something you couldn't just say well i can't do it but right. um that there is more of a app, app you know people are more apt and businesses are more apt to say it's sales let's just start with a base what does that look like um it's not super yet um the smaller the customer or the less complicated a lot of times they go just show me what the regular sales thing is can we tweak this can we tweak that um so i don't know i i look at does it how well does it fit if it fits pretty darn good and we can just layer a little bit on top of it. Seems like a slam dunk. If it is totally different or they're coming from legacy where it's all mashed into one and there isn't a good fitment, to me it seems to make sense to to go through custom. Um, yeah, you know, and you know that and that's the thing. Like a net new customer is very, I would think very differently for a brand new customer to the platform than I would someone who's upgrading. And that's as you guys know, that's kind of tough on the head, right? Because you're constantly thinking in one mode, and then someone goes, "Can we do?" Well, yeah, you could do, oh, wait a minute, you're starting new. You just, let's go here first, you know? It's a challenge for somebody who's been doing it. They have this big monolithic app that they have to move away from, and then they have to move their team members over here now. So um, my biggest wish is in this in this area is the ability to save as a model driven app because everything else, including Canvas apps, including forms, including business process flows, including all this stuff, you can take what Microsoft gives you, save a copy, edit yep. the copy, and then you're safe. And we really need that, I think, with apps to give me the ability to, I'm licensed for sales, give me the ability to save the sales hub to make Joel's super duper sales hub, change it the way I want, leave the original one kind of pristine as it is, as a reference, and then, and then, yeah, good to go. No, that's, a, I mean, that's a really good idea. I, and it's interesting how this bumps up awfully close to solutions versus apps right and Mm -hmm. what is the difference what you know how does this work and the you know there there is a lot of effort between now and and this fall um and probably you know this time next year of let's make sure the experience of putting an app together is let um get the best of the old thing because there still are some really great things about the old app and solution editor that need to come forward and they will um let you people like worry less status reasons for example <laughs> i that might be one of them i'm thinking more like this the navigation piece but uh yeah. you, you know there's get those components that are really making the old thing which is not optimal making it sticky i don't like that but i like going to the old one better me specifically because of the navigation not because i know it but it, to me it just makes sense like Here's a bucket, expand the bucket, and that now I don't have to type what I'm looking for. So that's you know, that's something that'll be coming forward. Um, and then when you're in make, you know, I want to make stuff. If we're gonna put all of it into the portal, so unification of things like, you know, is this form bound to an entity or not? You know, canvas versus model, rather than starting off, I know what I need to do. Why not open it up, let people right. start building it? Um, for prototyping and really setting down that base layer, figuring things out, that's going to help um, remove some of those concerns that are not on purpose, but they are artificial-ish, right? They're they're there and they could be gotten rid of, and and the team is working really hard to get rid of those things and those boundaries. So, um, yeah, it'll be 
I'm really interested to see all that work and effort in the fundamentals category um, now that those things are really stitched up much nicer and there's still work to be done, but it's getting done. Um, you have this monumentous amount of effort that gets put on things like dev teams handling those, those um, you know, whether they're bugs or design changes that come in, but then also now being more nimble and having a better strategy of how we do release and, and servicing the stuff that we'll be able to get out over the next year, I, I'm really excited to see. Um, and, you know, we, we do work as closely as we can with those teams. And so um, it's great when they reach out and we get to share things like, I'm sure you guys are all in contact too, um, between the DL and, and other connections um, that, you know, the response there is much better um, than it was say three, four years ago or five years ago and oh, yeah. more work is getting done faster. And, and I think at a way higher quality and, and a lot of that has to do with you're putting out smaller things faster um and i think the fundamentals being better really drives to a better quality bar so um there's always work to be done but i am just hugely impressed i'm i'm really happy with how things are turning out what do you think taper should we let george ask another developer question before we... <laughs> i think we can, i think we can he's jones for a dev question been good. he's been quiet please george i i don't have any developers question, but uh, I have a suggestion for teams um, uh, for the backgrounds. Uh, can we have Sean McNally's hair as an option? <laughs> so I can put it on. Just put it right on there. So yep. anybody listening uh, there, you can download a desktop Snapchat camera and it layers over the top of your camera and you can put images and hair and glasses and that can be your your camera through teams so i don't have it on this computer but apparently it blows cpu out of the water completely oh it's killer yeah. plug in because that sucker will rip your battery <laughs> apart yeah, yeah. But i was just, the robot but had it pretty cool what it wouldn't is. you do for a good hair yeah yeah well that's my favorite thing to do is jump on with the state director somewhere, you know, as my head expressed as a, a roll of toilet paper, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's there's one of them that will show like double view, then four of you, then eight of you, and you go pretty high, like till there's 30 of you. I've been using that sometimes and just during the call. Incrementing the, it? There's two of me and then there's <laughs> four of me. It's like I'm multiplying during the call. It's awesome. Excellent. And I, yeah. I love, I love people turning on their webcam and seeing that they're in their you know bratty t-shirt and stuff like that that's been yeah. the that's been the biggest thing to me to be on calls where the vice president from the company's on and he's wearing he's wearing a t-shirt that obviously has been around for many years oh yeah yeah as a whole in it and <laughs> yeah. stuff you're like you make more money than that you can you can afford to at least go with the polo and, and I, I want the, Microsoft I want to this. see how long the beard has gotten. Yeah, yeah. I hear Perfect Patel is giving uh, Santa Claus a run for his money these days. That's why. Is I that his thing? He's guys... not going to shave until he's out of quarantine. <laughs> I just want the guys. Do you see people using quarantine uh, as an excuse to be sloppy in their uh, in their work? Because now we will have excuse. I, I mean, given people are more forgiven, like my customers definitely have, leave a bit more room for the sleep deadlines and things like that. And we try and not to abuse this uh, goodwill. Oh. Um, but I, I, I wonder I if you've so. seen the cases uh, where people kind of start abusing this goodwill. I've that, seen, uh, as of right now, I've seen the guy right now. If I lose any deals, I'm blaming COVID for it, whether it was COVID. <laughs> oh, you know, they, they, they aren't going to do it because of COVID, you know? Uh, I, I would say from a from a delivery standpoint, I'm not seeing that. If anything, it's 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 the customer th gets the concept of, well, you're you're not traveling, you're available, so you should be able to do what I need you to do. And for all intents and purposes, I mean, that's that's true, so... We're, yeah, we're, I, we're actually getting more work, at least my projects, I'm getting more work because of it. Yeah, and I think, you know, and um, I guess my case might be a little bit different. There's there's several of us that work with government customers or working on task forces for um, like, you know, test, drive up testing and stuff. And so that this is the busiest by far I have been in 16 years at the company. We've been through some really busy 
We've been through some slow times, but we've been through some really busy times, and this beats it a hundred times. It seems like, um, and it, yeah, it's, and I, I, you know, thank goodness, I, my wife is much with her job able to decouple a little bit more from calls and and help coach the kids and stuff, and so she's been able to kind of be teacher and full time uh, remote worker, and um, yeah, so it's, but by far the the customers have been very forgiving, and and I do think in some cases we're happy to over deliver if you want to call it that it sounds weird but i do ha, look i experienced it firsthand because uh before when customer calls I, i'd be like i'm sorry i already left the office uh so can we do it tomorrow and customer yeah okay yeah fair enough and now they're more like i know you there <laughs> i know, I know you, you're, your you're welcome i called you you have something to do now <laughs> well thanks uh sean mcnellis <laughs> And Sean Tabor, but thanks, Sean, for for joining us again. And uh, you're always welcome back here. This is always informative to talk to you and find out what's really going on with the PFE team. And yeah, well, next time maybe we can bring Deacon with, and we can really confuse people. And or oh, Sean yeah, Nolf. Sean Nolf is also a uh, PFE now. So let's get as many Shans as we can. I think that'd be fantastic. I we <laughs> really should <laughs> every spelling. That's right. And maybe Shan MacArthur for the for yeah. us to give it just you know? to screw it all up. Yeah. Just to screw. Yeah. It. <laughs> my 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 current project the the uh, the uh, the C- CSP is named Sean. There's a consultant named Sean, and I'm the architect. So it's a good time. All three of the my wedding were named John. That was really easy because it said Hey John, and they all like turn around. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, stay safe. And um, hopefully we'll kind of work our way through this here in short order and everything will be better than the worst case scenario. So Absolutely. we can hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stay safe, guys. Join us right. next time. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>